Okay, good morning, everyone, again. Um, so I'd like to introduce you our next speaker, Miguel Sanchez de Leon Peque, who's a software engineer at Open Sistemas, a medium company based here in Madrid. And he's going to be talking about automated trading. Thank you. So uh, welcome, everybody, to this presentation on Python for developing a real-time automated trading platform. I'm glad to see so many of you here today. Um, first of all, a little bit about us. Um, this project has been developed in Open Sistemas, uh, which is a company based in Madrid, and in particular in the research and development department or division, which is led by Fernando Monera. A little bit about me as well. Uh, my name is Miguel Sánchez de Leon Peque. I'm an industrial engineer with backgrounds in electronics, automatic control, and computer science. And I feel passion for programming data, statistics, and machine learning. I started programming with Python about two years ago, exactly when I started working with Open Systemas. And since then, I've been gradually falling in love with this programming language. So what's the motivation behind this project? If you go on the internet and search for currently available platforms for real-time automated training, uh, you may find things like TradeStation, MetaTrader, NinjaTrader, and in fact, many, many others each of them with their own little differences. However, they all share some caveats. So for example, they are all proprietary. They are very heavily desktop oriented. So many of them cannot even run if you don't have a desktop environment. Uh, do they provide Linux support? Well, no. And most of them, they, don't, they do not provide non-Windows support. And the most important questions, perhaps, can I use Python to create my strategies? And the answer here is a big no. So what we wanted? We wanted to have control over our own tool. So we needed to have the source code to be able to modify it at will. Uh, we wanted to have an optional graphical user interface. And we wanted this tool to be multi-platform so that we were able to run it in the, at least in the main operating systems. And uh, we wanted it to be programmed in Python, of course. So is this possible? That's the question. So allow me to introduce you to OS Markets. OS Markets is a broker-independent platform for real-time automated trading. With broker independent, I mean it should be able to work with any broker available out there as long as, of course, the broker provides you with a convenient API to interact with. Uh, it is implemented over OS Brain. Uh, we'll see later what that means. Okay, but for now, I think it is sufficient to know that OS Brain is a, what is called a multi agent system in which different agents or actors uh, run independently and communicate with each other using message passing. It is designed for real time automated trading. Uh, so that means it must be fast, which it is, and it must be also robust. This is an overview of a system or architecture of OS markets. As we can see, the input of this system is just the raw market data coming from the broker. That means the updates on market data or market prices. And the output of this system is, of course, the buy or sell operations, which are sent back to the broker. Um, We'll see uh, what well, those little circles in there are the agents or the actors in the multi-agent system. And the, the arrows in between represent the message passing. The names inside the circles are just the roles that the agents are playing. Because normally agents are specialized in a certain role that they play in the, in, in the overall system. So we'll start describing these agents. We'll start from the left. The first one is called the feeder. Oops, I'm sorry. The first one is called the feeder, and its, it's only purpose is to get market data from the broker. That means uh, this agent cannot be independent uh, from the from the platform, cannot be platform independent. So we must implement different feeders for different brokers. It is also a multi-threaded agent. We'll see later what that means, but uh, this uh, particular agent usually needs to deal at least with uh, one thread that is getting real-time market data updates and another thread that is able to uh, attend requests from the agents in the, in the system for, for example, historical data. Uh, just at the, on the right of uh, Feeder, we can find Router. Router is uh, finally a broker independent provider. So it's kind of like a feeder, but in this case, it's broker independent. Uh, its purpose is to store and distribute this market data among the agents in the system, in OS markets. So uh, the rest of the agents can subscribe to new updates that come from router. Uh, it is also able to update the market data that it has available in memory with uh, all the information that is coming from the feeders. And also it's able to resample data if that is necessary. 
Uh, market data is implemented using NumPy arrays. Um, perhaps the main market data structures are the ticks, which are simply the ask and bid prices at a given timestamp. The bar, which is usually uh, an open high, low, close prices during a time span. And then, and then the bar series, uh, which is simply a series of bars, sorted, of course, by the timestamp. Uh, as you may have noticed, the uh, bar, bar series are updated in real time. So in order to avoid full memory copies on each update, what we do is uh, we just use a view of a NAMP array, a base array, or a buffer, which is the one that we update with new bars. So if a new bar comes, we just update the base array, and then we ch simply change the view, which is uh, much faster than performing a full memory copy. Uh, on the right of router, we can find the brains um, the brains are the most commonly, common agents in the system and are able to subscribe to router in order to receive uh, updates on market data and are able to subscribe also to other brains. Uh, these agents run the actual algorithms for automated trading. So they are the, perhaps the most important uh, agents in the system. So they must be able also to send orders like buy or sell. And, um, well, of course, today I'm not talking about the algorithms that we have implemented in, in open systems, but uh, I think it's important to note that thanks to the great ecosystem available out there for data analysis and machine learning in Python, um, you can do almost anything you want with these brains. You can make use of NumPy, of Pandas, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, Theano, whatever you want, Namba. So at the end you can do anything that you can do with Python, which usually means just anything. One of the best things about this kind of architecture is that you can create some kind of abstraction um, in this way, just creating a hierarchy in which the lowest level brains are those that are calculating using the raw market data. And then as we go up in the layers, we start uh, treating concepts more, which are more abstract or more uh, like how a human trader works. So we can start talking about uh, market in intention or market structure or detecting some kind of patterns. And the last agent that we have here in the overview is the one on the right, which is the trader, which is uh, uh, similar to the feeder. It means uh, it is broker dependent, of course, and its only purpose is to handle orders. Okay, so buy, sell orders coming from the brains, and then it ex executes its, uh, these orders against the broker. So just to make it clear, uh, here's an example. Imagine that we have uh, that system in which we don't have the blue brain in there, and then at some point we spawn it. We can do that in real time. And then this brain requests some uh, historical data to router. Router may not have this data available, so it will send the request to feeder. The feeder will get the data from the broker, and then we'll send it back to router and from router back to the brain, all in a, syn in a synchronous way. Okay, so from that point, the brain uh, may start uh, subs subscribing to uh, real-time updates from the, from the router, and then uh, performing some calculations in order to generate orders that will send to trader. And also, it may start publishing uh, some information about the things that we have calculated within this brain. And other brains may need this information or make use, may, may be able to use it. Uh, there are other agents that we have mentioned, such as the logger to log error or warning messages, the informer, which we can use to uh, publish information about the account's balance, or the overmind, which is kind of a con console to control the agents that are running, so we can kill some or spawn new ones whenever we want. Uh, we have also developed, as I say, a graphical user interface. Uh, this graphical user interface is um, for real-time market data visualization and also for real-time visualization of indicators. The indicators are just kind of mathematical transformation of the raw market data. Uh, this graphical user interface is really good, in, well integrated with OS markets, okay? And we'll see later how we, do, how, how we did this. Um, in order to implement this graphical user interface, we have used uh, Qt, perhaps, uh, because it is the most widely used, and um, also because uh, it is really great it has really great portability. But uh, I think most importantly uh, is PyQt Graph. PyQt Graph is uh, much less known than Qt. But it's a great tool which is written in pure Python and it's a library for fast real-time display. 
And the best thing about this library is that it implements all the user interface, all the user interaction interaction, sorry, that we need. So uh, panning or zooming in one axis or two axis is all implemented and working out of the box, as well as uh, updating in real time the axis. So uh, here's an overview of the main window in which we can see a list of um, the currently running brains in the network and from the main window we can create new tabs or new windows with different and independent charts. Apart from that, uh, we can see how the chart is implemented. This is all PyQt graph, okay? We can change from here the data that we are displaying from the market. So in this case, we have just changed the period from one second period to two seconds periods. And uh, we have the option to post automatic update of the view and then as you can see, we can zoom in, zoom out. And we can see that everything works, works pretty well. And we haven't written a single line of code for that. It's all PyQt graph. Um, we also have this indicators menu in which uh, we can select the indicators that we want to add to the chart. We can add them as new plots, as you can see. So we can uh, visualize indicators below the market data. And we can also add indicators that are plotted uh, over the market data, such as, for example, this uh, simple moving average. And of course, we are able to uh, change the parameters of these indicators also in real time. And of course, the, the, the graphics view gets updated. Of course, um, you can remove the indicators and everything, all the zooming and panning still works pretty well. So um, it is important, okay, to note that uh, this graphical user interface, as I said, it was optional. So it is uh, well integrated into OS Brain. How did we do this? Uh, simply because all the charts are agents in this uh, multi-agent system. Okay, so when we are visualizing this data, it's simply because uh, the chart is subscribed to real-time updates from router. And when we are visualizing those indicators, it is also simply because we are subscribed to a brain that is publishing this information to us. So at the end, all the calculations are performed in the multi-agent system, okay, in OS markets. So um, I have explained a little bit on how we have implemented the graphical user interface, but I haven't explained how we implemented OS markets or this multi-agent system. So. Uh, this is always brain, okay, and it's a general purpose uh, multi-agent system written in Python. Um, this general purpose multi-agent system implements independent agents that run uh, and communicate with each other using message passing. And in particular, with always brain, we have uh, we were able to provide an easy configuration and deployment method, and we'll see later how we did this. When I say uh, general purpose, I mean uh, you can really use this for many other things. Okay, you can use it for uh, not logistics, logistics, transportation, or even military and defense applications. In our case, we also use it for distributed computing. So we use these agents that are distributed among different machines, and then um, we distribute uh, s some groups or random selected backtests, and then each of the workers perform a. Um, an analysis and create a correlation matrix and calculate some kind of indicators and then we take into account to generate portfolios that are kind of optimized. Uh, so uh, when I say that these agents are independent, the question is uh, how I, are they implemented, right? So processes or threads, well, if you have met the GIL, then you already know the answer. It's all, of course, processes. And if you don't know the GIL, then it's better for you because uh, your life will be much simpler. Uh, I also said that we implemented message passing. How did we do this? Uh, it was using Serum Q. There are many reasons, uh, but the first one is just because it's a great project. It's so cool. So really, if you don't have a project that needs it, uh, you should make one because it's really fun. Uh, I totally recommend it. So right now, we have an idea of what a basic agent is. Uh, we know that it is a system process. 
that runs independently. It implements methods for easy binding and connecting with different patterns. The, these patterns are implemented in SUMQ, so we have the classic push-pull or request-reply or publish-subscribe patterns. Um, it activates on incoming message. Uh, this, mean use, this means usually an agent is running a main thread, a main process, which is just waiting or pulling on input sockets for a message to arrive. And that's when we start uh, executing some code in the agent. Uh, Multithreading multi -threading may be used as well within the agent, and in order to do so, what we do is to create in-process sockets, that's also a serial MQ implementation, um, to communicate with the main thread, okay? So we, we, we always try to avoid concurrency, so we always use message passing even uh, within the same agent. Um, configuration, I said it was uh, pretty simple, so how? We know that the agents are independent, but they, man, they must know the addresses of other agents if we want to connect them, okay? So at the end, there may be many, many sockets, so perhaps creating a configuration file would be too tedious, would be too complex, we are not interested in that, and in fact, uh, for many agents, or for most of them, uh, assigning a random address is perhaps uh, simpler and more convenient, we just don't care which address uh, this agent is binding to. So if only we could, it's just an idea, have something like a name server, like an address book, where we can register all these agents, um, have something like an overmind, an entity that was able to uh, know the addresses that uh, the agents are binded to, in order to send them to other agents that are going to connect to the, to the first one. So is this possible? And here's where Pyro4 comes in, which is another great piece of software, and also not much well known, I think. Pyro4 comes from Python remote objects, and it allows us to treat remote objects as local. This is done uh, with an object that is called a proxy, and we can use this proxy to call methods that are implemented in the remote agent, and then these calls are serialized and sent to the remote agent, executed there, and then the return is serialized back to us. So uh, we can treat them just as if we were uh, dealing with local objects, but everything is being executed remotely. So it's great, very, very convenient. And apart from that, already has a name server implementation, so it's a win-win decision. So now we, we know what a real agent is. It is a system process. Uh, it runs a Pyro multiplexes server. Um, the server actually serves an, ag an agent object, okay, using Pyro. And then we have a main thread, as I mentioned before, that runs the main loop. This is what is called a one-way call in Pyro. So as a conclusion, um, we, ha we were able to implement a general purpose multi-agent system with Python in which agents are independent and communicate with each other using message passing. And we have achieved an easy deployment and re remote configuration process uh, using Pyro4. So uh, let's start with a little bit, with some code samples, just to understand how this works. This is the most basic sample, which is uh, Hello World. And in this case, as you can see, let me think. In here, which we're just running a name server, okay, a random name server. And then in here, we're running an agent that we call example. This is an alias. And we tell them to register in this name server. And what do we have here? Okay, this variable is actually a proxy. Okay, it's, it is not the remote object. This function will start a new process in the system but that by default will bind to localhost. And then uh, with, this, uh, with this proxy, we can call methods that are implemented in the remote object. So we can call, for example, the method loginfo, which is just an information login, and say, hello world. Okay, when we do this, this call, loginfo hello world, gets serialized, it gets sent, it, it's been sent to the remote object, the remote agent, and the agent will execute it. Okay, this is a second example, uh, which is a simple one as well, in which we are going to implement a push-pull pattern. Okay, so in this case, uh, we are doing just as before, we are creating a name server, and then uh, we are creating two, two agents, a sender and a receiver. We call them Alice and Bob. And then um, what we do is to bind the sender using the push pattern, which is, again, a CRMQ communication pattern. 
uh, we give this socket an alias, okay, simply because it's easier to refer to it later that way. And then uh, what, we get, what we get in return is the address, the actual address, where uh, the sender bind it, because we didn't specify uh, a port, for example. So by default, it binds to localhost, and then it will select a random port, because we just don't care. So this call is executed in the remote agent, but then we get this variable here in this script, okay? And then what we do is, again, to serialize this call we're going to tell the receiver to connect to this address. So this will be serialized. And we are going to serialize the address, which is a local object. And then we are going to serialize as well a function, a function that will be used as a handler. This handler is implemented in here, and it's really simple. It's just as before. What uh, we're going to do is to get this message, the message that, that we received, and simply lock uh, some information. And we will say received and the message. So once we have done this, we're going to start an infinite loop, and then we're going to start sending message from the sender. So what would, what would we get in return? Okay, in the console, if we executed this, we would start seeing messages saying received, hello world, received, hello world, received, hello world. Okay, this would be another example in this case of in this case of um, OS markets, in this case, uh, we're going to uh, define a class, okay, that inherits from Brain, because we can also use object-oriented programming if we like to. So uh, we're just telling this agent that on new bar, this is the behavior. So if the close value right now is higher than before, we're going to buy, otherwise we're going to sell, and then we send the order. It's pretty simple and it's stupid and don't do it with your money, of course. And here, what we're going to do is to create an ONDA architecture. Uh, this call is, uh, will simplify the creation of, of all the common agents, like uh, the feeder, and as well the router, and the trader. They will all be created, and they will all start working with ONDA or against the ONDA broker, so we just have to provide our account information. And then we tell the system to start streaming real-time updates on euro-dollar pair. And then we can add a brain to the system in which we specify the class. So we serialize again this class. And this class uh, will be used to create an object in the remote agent, in this case, in the remote brain. And it will be served by Pyro. And that's it. Uh, then we can just call this subscribe method which will make uh, this brain, the brain example that we just created, subscribe to uh, real-time updates from router on the euro-dollar pair uh, based on one minute period. And that's it, as a final conclusion, uh, Python has been proved to be a great tool for implementing a real-time automated training platform. And uh, one last thing, uh, I'm really happy uh, to communicate that uh, OS Brain has just been released you are the, fir the first to know, in fact, outside of the company. So you can find uh, this multi-agent system in PyPy and in GitHub if you want to check the source code. And of course, you can find some documentation. It's a work in progress because we didn't have much time. Uh, so that's it. If you want to contact us, uh, you can send an email to me. There you have my email address or Fernand Monera. There you have also some links if you want to visit our website or our blog or if you want to follow us on Twitter. Also, uh, we are hiring. So if you like Python or if you like trading or if you don't like any of them but you still like data analysis or big data or data visualization or web integration or anything that you find in the world we do in our website, then do not hesitate to send us your, your CV to rrhh at opensystemas.com. So that's it. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions. Thanks, Miguel, for this great talk. So we have the time for several questions. And um, may I just ask you that we are recording everything. So please wait for us to give you the microphone. Um, hi. Thank you for the talk. Really interesting. Um, just how does Pyro 4 deal with uh, 
exceptions or errors? Like, is the traceback sent back to the caller, or is it just silent in the agent that it's being yes, called? Yes, of course, uh, it's not easy to send a traceback, like the full traceback, <laughs> to serialize it. So, no, you just uh, can get the message with the traceback. Mm -hmm. So you can use the traceback dot format X format exception and get that information if that is useful for you. But uh, of course, uh, you usually have agents that work well because you have tests that validate their functionality without the need to run it remotely, right? So you you write the tests locally, you validate the the agent, and then you run it remotely. But anyway, if it crashes, yes, you get some information, okay, but not everything, of course. Uh, Pyro uses by default, well, at least in OS Brain. OS Brain uses by default uh, uh, Pickle for serialization and can use also Deal if you are dealing with the proxies. Okay, uh, but it's still that's that's not easy, I think. <laughs> Hello, and what is the uh, performance of this? How many transactions can you uh, do in a second or? Uh yeah. Because Python, it's considered to be slow, so yes. you use CPython. That is the standard interpreter, it's not We use C Python. yeah. We use CPython because uh, for us it has been proved to be sufficiently fast for real time. Of course, that depends on your application. Our performance is limited to the performance of uh, Pi CRMQ, which is the, the Python bindings for CRMQ, which is the message passing that is used between the agents. I mean, Deal and, and Pyro are kind of slower, but we only use that for deployment and configuration. After that, all the message passing is, use, is done using Pickle for serialization and CRMQ or Pi CRMQ for message passing. So that will be our bottleneck. But anyway, uh, the bottleneck is always uh, with the internet, so against the broker. It's always much slower to get the messages from the broker and then to send the messages to the broker through the internet, like by the could take, I don't know, 50 milliseconds. But anyway, for real time, it's more than enough. Hi. So first, uh, thank you very much for the talk. And I will have uh, several questions. Namely, uh, historically, um, these kind of problems were handled with tools that are labeled as CEP, uh, Complex Event Processing. And a lot of companies have invested a lot of money to solve that problem. You have Storm from Twitter, which was also open sourced. You have the Lam uh, Lambda architecture from uh, LinkedIn, Samza, Spark, and a gazillion tools. And I'm just interested, why did you feel that you have to invent something similar, and which is like very similar to the existing tools? Mm -hmm. That would be the first part of the question. Well, I may disagree uh, with that they are very similar. Uh, this is completely written in Python. That might be an advantage. It is an advantage to us, and we like that. Um, this project, of course, has evolved. Okay, We didn't have this intention. We didn't want to implement this at, the, at first, right? We started simply using CRMQ and separate processes. But at the end, we find out that uh, these tools uh, could be glued together and work pretty well. So, for example, the use of Pyro, I don't think you can uh, do things like that with those tools that you're mentioning. And also, while well, having a full Python implementation. Um, yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, the problems you mentioned are, of course, solved in a different way, in different frameworks. Um, but, okay, yeah. Uh, so the other part would be, um, I didn't notice that you would talk about the edge cases, which are, like, very important in um, frameworks like th this. And especially if you're playing with money. So I'm talking about things like um, how are you guaranteeing that the events are processed exactly once? And, um, you know, um, if you're connected to uh, several data streams, how are you really sure that the events that are coming in are really ordered? Because it could happen that you get from Wanda some I really, I really what, sorry? I really? Or ordered, ah, ordered, like okay. one after another. Mm -hmm. Because it could happen that you get something from Oanda at time t, but because of uh, latency issues or whatever you get from Dukas copy or whatever exchange, uh, an event which uh, happened before that, but later. 
-hmm. So traditionally, people used something like Kafka, which solves your locking problems in distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, because, of course, uh, traditionally, you have a lot of smaller systems which, wants, uh, which want to access the latest state of the system. So nope. you have the locking problems. That was a long question. But anyway, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, yeah, the thing is that with zero MQ, and that's what I like about this architecture, you are free to implement your message passing. So you mean, how can you be sure that you only receive the message one? Well, it depends on your application. It's, if that is important for you, you can implement manually those patterns for communications. Uh, for our case, in fact, we just use publish subscribe because in real time we don't care even if we don't receive one tick once, which is something that doesn't happen, but we don't care. We just have a flow of data, and we want to process it as fast as possible. If there is little wrong data or some missing data, we don't care. We just want to keep uh, working. Okay? Normally, that, would, that won't affect your strategy. So you're not afraid uh, that you would make, um, based on different data, the same decision twice because your workers would process the same event twice or three times, and you would then basically go the same path as Knight Capital or something like that. Uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> sure. So you're saying that you're not afraid that based on one event, uh, the workers would processes, pr process it multiple times and no, that, that won't happen. Okay. Um, sorry if, if you understood that. No, that won't happen because we are only send, uh, sending those, uh, that, that data once. Okay? The worst that can happen is that we miss a packet, okay, a message once. Well, we don't care about that because usually you just have a tick. So maybe your bar will be formed a little bit different. A little, a little bit different. But uh, that's not really important. In fact, when you change brokers, the data that you get from those brokers is also different. So uh, it's not important. If the data that you get is 1% uh, different, which is, which is not, is, uh, we, we don't care. Okay, so that's the good thing about this, that we can implement uh, a flexible, not very strict message passing, such as publish, subscribe, that works pretty well and pretty fast. We are more interested in speed than in, for example, getting all the exact data that brokers is providing us. Because we, we don't trust that data anyway, not that much. OK, at first, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. And my question is uh, that in such uh, multi-agent systems, uh, we have another problem is for example, that uh, one of the processes um, may die unexpectedly, and so how to m monitor this overall system, and um, uh, what is be the reaction if, for example, some agent dies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank of you. course, uh, monitoring is also implemented uh, by the developer, the developer, so that depends on your application. We are, we are monitoring our agents and our brains, and. One of the best things about this architecture is that exactly if one brain, for example, dies, crashes, which is something that should never happen, and never happens, <laughs> then uh, you can kill it and you can respawn it, and everything works as, as expected. And why is that? And that is, again, thanks to Zero MQ, because, uh, for example, uh, you can bind, sorry, you can connect to, a, to an address that is not binded yet. So there's no problem. If there's a client that is connected or subscribed to an, a brain that is publishing information, then this brain can die. And we can kill it. We can create a new one, and it will start receiving the same information. It, it won't break anything around. So agents are completely independent. Thank you. Um, great talk. Um, NumPy uh, arrays, uh, NumPy arrays. Uh, why why did you choose those? What features uh, were you looking for um, that you couldn't find in uh, in basic types? Uh, that's that's one point. And secondly, I'd agree with the uh, the last two uh, uh, questioners about uh, such a complex system. Uh, you've got a, an agent going down, coming up. Uh, the uh, discontinuity 
Um, it worries me greatly, about, especially when it's handling finance. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Can you speak so, a little bit slower? Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the question was, why numpy arrays? Ah, okay. And also, uh, uh, reassure me about uh, discontinuities, okay. nodes popping up, popping down. Um, you've talked about pickles. Uh, you've talked about pickles over the internet. This is scary. Yeah, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't talk about... Okay. Uh, I'll answer the second one first. I didn't talk about pickle over the internet. It is true that it is, this system is completely unsafe by default. So it is meant to be executed in a control or restricted environment. For example, in a, in a cluster or on, just in your own computer. If you want to communicate uh, between agents in remote machines and you have to pass over the internet, then it is up to you to implement the, the, the security. So you may want to use a VPN or an SSH tunnel, but of course this is not secure. Yeah. It's only secure if you have programmed it. And uh, for the first question, why NumPy arrays? Um, the answer is that uh, all the ecosystem available out there for data analysis, not all, but most of the ecosystem seems to work well with uh, NumPy arrays. So why wouldn't? Why wouldn't we use NumPy arrays? Okay, well, um, why wouldn't you? Because they're more expensive and uh, I, I was wondering what features you were after, but don't worry about it. Uh, the, the, the idea that a brain, though, doesn't use your own DSL, but actually is just pure Python code, I don't see what your product offers besides uh, a collection of already existing frameworks for creating a large uh, system. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling to see I'm, where I'm the sorry, value I, I, is. Can you ask again the question a little bit slower? I have difficulties <laughs> for hearing you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> You uh, don't have uh, a DSL, a domain-specific language, mm -hmm. which abstracts away all the bad things that you could do as a developer when writing a brain. Uh -huh. So what does your product offer in terms of stability and predictability that the components will work together as a system? Because I don't see any yet. Mm -hmm. No, what we do is uh, just implement test of uh, the independent agents and then of the whole ecosystem, and that's it. I'm sorry that all the questions you, you get are the kind why you are not using this uh, on that technology, but my question to you is about that. <laughs> Uh, my question is about Twisted, because it is Python, and I would expect to be good in this kind of a situations, and uh, you are not using it, I guess. You have a reason mm -hmm. why. So, as, as I said, this uh, has been evolving uh, in, the, in the past months, so we didn't start with the idea of creating our own tool, but that just happened. I mean, we liked CRMQ very much. I don't know uh, if the tools that you're mentioning implement this flexible, low-level uh, communication patterns or not. And also, I don't know if they implement some things like Pyro. I guess we could implement another tool uh, using that, uh, that framework, for example, and then using Pyro as well for the configuration. Yeah, maybe, maybe that works as well. Mm -hmm. Hi again. So um, I'm very interested um, how are you thinking or how are you approaching uh, testing this framework? Because uh, as you already mentioned, it's a composition of separate agents. And um, I mean, how are you appro approaching the testing and um, how are you testing uh, the whole system? Are you just using end-to-end -end tests? What kind of tests? Are there any tools you could recommend? So what's your experience with mm -hmm. that? Because I think it's very a, di a very different problem than what we are doing. Uh, I mean, most of us here probably um, each uh, day. Um, I mean, we know we are aware of the tests for the websites and things like that. And this kind of problem looks a bit different. So I would be interested in how are you testing this beast? Mm -hmm. uh, we are testing this uni using unit test and pi test, and that's it. But anyway, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you, and I'm sure you will explain me uh, better tools for doing this.
Hey, um, one quick uh, question. Uh, in finance trading, you, your brain must know uh, a current state, for example, all, all your open positions. Mm-hmm. And I would like to know how you save this state and how you replay uh, what needed to know the state. And if, uh, for example, uh, a brain dies, how, how you still know your open positions? Mm-hmm. Well, your open positions are usually anyway stored in the broker, but of course we store it locally as well. That depends on your implementation. Uh, you can make trader store uh, that information, or you can make, if you're going to, perf- to implement some kind of uh, weird handling of the orders, you can implement it in the brain. Anyway, we've got, as I mentioned, I think before, uh, other agents, such, such as the informer, which are publishing information about, for example, the account state, or uh, the rates are which you can trade your accounts currency against other currencies so in this in this uh, sense is completely flexible I mean it's it's up to you great thank you to all of you for uh, asking so many interesting questions and please join me in thanking all the speakers from this morning again